Our Lord and our Father, we, we count ourselves so privileged to be here this morning and to be alive. We went to bed and we woke up. Thank you, Lord. Jeremiah says that your mercies are new every morning. And because of your great love, we have not been consumed. We have not done a, thing, a single thing that would qualify us to be alive. But you've been merciful to us and you've given us another opportunity to live and to do your will. So help us as we start the day today. I pray that you breathe over me, that you breathe over your word. The Lord, it will come forth in power. I pray, Lord, that you take over my speech, over my thinking, and over everything about me. That your word will come without error. And that, Lord, we will be strengthened as we continue to walk with you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And good morning. We thank God so much for the opportunity to be here. And I'm particularly very thankful. I just want to begin by sharing a testimony uh, that uh, God is a faithful God. He keeps his promises. It doesn't matter how long it takes uh, because the scripture says that before God, a thousand years are like a day. And the day is like what? A thousand years. So if you look at that mathematics, you realize that you probably don't live more than hours on this earth. Because eight years, if you put it on God's mathematical scale, he says a thousand years are like one day. Now if you live eight years, <laughs> you probably just lived for hours. But uh, there is something as a family that we've been waiting upon God for, for 15 years. And uh, it hadn't come yet. We'd been married for 15 years without a child. But last year, on the 17th of December, we welcomed our baby girl. <laughs> And so for us, she's a symbol of the faithfulness of God. I think for me, one of the lessons God has kept teaching me in life is called patience. I think I'm not a very patient person. <laughs> when I'm driving and there is jam, the first thing that comes to me is to think about an alternative route. And maybe some of you are like that. But God has taught me patience that I can't put God on pressure. You know, some of us, you want God to do things when you want them. I have learned that God does things in his time for one purpose only, to glorify his name. Not to glorify you, but to glorify his name. Amen. Um, we are going to share uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to read uh, some, like, five verses. But our topic is faith that rests on the power of God. Faith that rests on the power of God. And this is what the scripture says. Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence of speech with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the mystery, the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ and him crucified. Verse 3. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. 
Our topic is faith that rests in the power of God. Faith that rests in the power of God. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, helps to define what faith is. And it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. All of us as human beings have things we hope for. And there are things that we can't see right now, but somehow in our minds and in our hearts, we visualize those things. Now, in as far as our relationship with God is concerned, what enables us to hope for things that have not yet happened is faith. In our relationship with God, what connects us with God is faith. You cannot get anything from God without faith. Faith is like a currency that enables us to access what God has already provided for us. I have come to realize that before any one of us is created in their mother's womb, God has already made provision for anything and everything you will need. Ephesians chapter 2, I think it's Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul teaches that God has blessed us with everything, but it is in the supernatural realm, in the heavenly places. When you pray for something, it doesn't mean that that's when God wakes up and says, oh, I didn't know that Daniel needed this. God has already made provision for everything you will ever need. But for you to access it, the currency for that access is called faith. It's so amazing because we don't manufacture faith. We just receive faith from God. It's God who gives us the ability to believe for things we, we do not see. And to hope for things that are not there right now. And so we are talking about faith that rests on the power of God. When you look at this building here, this building is resting on something. Before this building was raised, a foundation had to be made. And before the foundation was laid, the engineers had to make sure that the soil, the nature of the soil here will be able to hold the weight of the building. So this building is resting not just on the foundation, but on soil which was tested and proved that it had the ability to be able to hold the weight of this building. Now when we talk about faith that rests on the power of God, what we are simply talking about is that everything about us should rest or should be supported by nothing else but on what God can do. Our confidence is not in our abilities or in what someone else has told us or in our education, but in what God can do. And there is no better person in the scriptures who testifies about this than Paul. Paul's life and his conversion rested and revolved around one thing, what God can do. You remember that historically, Paul was a persecutor of the church. 
But when he encountered God and got transformed by God and became the kind of man that he became, he became a testimony of what God can do. That God can change a man who was a persecutor of the church into a vessel that contributed a lot to the text of scripture that we read in the New Testament. May your faith and your confidence rest in what God can do. Praise the Lord. And so that is what uh, Paul is helping us focus on. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. Now I want to paint a, a picture of what the Corinthian church was then when Paul was writing to this church. Actually, theologians tell us that Paul wrote four letters to the Corinthian church. But in the sacred texts, we have two of them. The first letter of Corinthians, which is 1 Corinthians, and the second letter. Now, in the first letter, Paul is addressing the circus in the church. He's addressing the problems in the church. He's addressing the problems among the believers in that church. There were certain things that were happening in the lives of the believers that were not pleasing God that Paul felt he had to address. There was so much division in that church. The believers in that church were living in a way that was not pleasing God. He says at some point that the kind of immorality that was happening in the church was of a kind that even people in the world could not speak about. And so Paul was putting the house in order. And so here, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he begins by telling them, eh? he begins by telling them about the message, the message that he brought. He says, when I came to you, I did not come to you with persuasive words of man's wisdom. Now, Paul, by the standards of today, was a very educated person. Paul was a consultant in matters concerning the law. He had sat at the feet of one of the best theologians of the time, or rabbis of the time, called Gamaliel. In as far as CV is concerned, Paul had the CV. But when Paul encountered Christ, he realized that everything that he had accumulated, everything that was a credit to his name, could not compare with Christ. And so Paul speaks to the church and what he presents to them is that his confidence is in nothing else but in Christ alone. And it reminds me of the writer of a song who wrote and said, in Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I imagine that this, in this congregation that Paul was teaching about, that, that, that Paul was teaching, People were having confidence in many things. Maybe people were, people were boasting about what they had accomplished. Maybe people were boasting about their gifts and their talents and their possessions. And Paul puts the believers in order and tells them everything that you think is a credit to you cannot be compared with Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about his experience. He says, he gives his CV. He says he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Eh? He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Pharisee. 
Eh? He was faultless. But he says that all those things that were credit to me, I now count as loss. I want to ask you a question and ask myself a question. What is it that you are boasting about? What is it in your life that you count more important than Christ? So Paul is reminding us this morning that even the wisdom of men cannot compare with what God can do. That the ability of men cannot compare with what God can do. Praise the Lord. God is going to bring you to a certain point in your life where you will learn that the ability of men cannot compare with what God can do. There are things that God will bring in your life where you'll have to depend on him and on him alone. For us, it was childlessness. We went to every kind of hospital and consulted all kinds of physicians. My wife took all kinds of medicines, fertility medicines, the, 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 the medical and the herbal, until we came to a place and said, Chino We came to a place and we said, Chino, Chino Lord, children come from you. Children are a gift from you. If you feel, if you feel that it is within your plan to give us a child, that belongs to you. We even stopped praying about it. And then God showed up. And then God showed up. God is going to bring you to a point in something in your life it might not be our experience, your own experience. Maybe it can be a situation of illness. Maybe it can be a situation within a family that you try in all your intellect and strength until you come to a place where you say, Chino nchikozechi, nchitade, mukama we kago sobola chino. It reminds me about the, 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 the raising of Lazarus from the dead. You know when Jesus was told that Lazarus is sick, he did not respond immediately. What did he say? He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for God to be glorified. He continued with his business. Until he was told Lazarus is dead. And then he came. When people had given up, they had buried Lazarus four days in the tomb. When he came and met Lazarus' sisters, they said, Lord, if you had been here, yeah, Lazarus would not have died. Like some of us, things happen and you begin saying, Mukama, where were you? Lord, where were you? <laughs> and then the Lord said, Lazarus will come back to life. And they took him to the tomb and they told, he told them to roll away the stone and they started, they started giving, them, giving him intellectual explanations. He's been buried for four days. His body is now rotting, you know. They started explaining to him the, the biology of decay. And he said, didn't I tell you eh, that if you believed, you would see what God can do. Faith that rests on what God can do. And to cut the long story short, Lazarus came out of the tomb. This morning I pray for you that God will give you faith. Yeah, that rests on only what God can do. So Paul was helping this church to focus on what God can do, not on what men can do, not on what their intellect can do, not on what their connections can do, not on what their jobs can do, but on only what God can do. Praise the Lord. He continues and says, I chose to know nothing except Christ and him alone crucified. Now let me tell you, in the church we teach so many things. This is one of the foremost topics we teach about is giving. You understand? 
Yeah? Sometimes you concentrate on relationships. Other times you concentrate on, 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 on deliveries. Other times you concentrate on other topics. But Paul tells them that there is only one topic I have for you. There is only one topic I've decided to teach. Christ and him alone crucified. Christ and him alone crucified. Everything revolves around Christ and nothing else. That when I'm teaching about deliverance, I'm not touching, teaching about deliverance as a topic. I'm talking about Christ, the deliverer. When I'm teaching about healing, I'm not just teaching about healing for the sake. I'm talking about Christ, the healer. When I'm talking about provision, I'm not just coercing people to give. I am exposing to them Christ, the provider. When I'm talking about peace, I am not giving them a, a moti motivational speech of, of, of positive self-image. I am talking about Christ, our peace. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So Paul is telling them, I have chosen not to concentrate on any other thing. May the church come back to the central message. Christ and him alone crucified. Not deliverance, not healing. Not Christ, the solid rock on which we stand. The more you look to him, the more your faith is built. In him is everything you need. The Bible says in Colossians that it pleased God to have his fullness dwell in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Many people are being confused today because they are just being taught attributes and they are not being taught the offer. Paul concentrated on the author. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, my ambition is in life is this. I want to know Christ. I want to know his power. I want to share in his sufferings. I want to become like him. That became his life's ambition. What is your life's ambition as a believer? We are so confused in the church today because we are only concentrating on the leaves. We are not concentrating on the tree. He said, I chose to know nothing. Sagala kumanya. I chose to know nothing. I have decided to focus on Christ and him alone crucified. It is his crucifixion that made available to you and I as sinners everything God, God has. Without, without Christ crucified, we are doomed. If he came, if Jesus came only to heal people and to deliver people, if he just did that and walked away, human beings would be doomed, would be eternally lost. He had to go to the cross to make available what God has, to make available to us eternity. He said, I came. That they may have life. He did not say, I came that they may have money. He said, I came that they may have life. Yes, money can be a component of life. But you see, we concentrate on the minors and neglect the majors. He said, I came that you may have life and have it in full. Not in doses. Only the cross, the cross is the key that ushers, it, ushers us into the fullness of the life of God. May we go back to the message of the cross. Paul at some point says, the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are doing what? Perishing. But for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the key to what God can do. That is why the central thing we need to preach about is people to come to the cross. People to get born again, to come to the cross. It is after the cross that everything God, God has becomes accessible. May God help us to concentrate on this. The key thing, the main thing, I read, uh, I think it was Stephen Covey's book, and uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and he made one statement that has stuck with me. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Even us as believers, the main thing is the cross. Let's keep the main thing, the, the main thing, the cross, Christ and him alone crucified. 
Praise the Lord. So Paul was putting the church in order. Do you know that if you listen to the wrong message, you'll get lost? If you have the wrong, if a computer has a wrong software, it will malfunction. What is a virus? A virus, a computer virus is also a software, by the way. It is a software which is on, when it's on your computer, it causes every other thing to malfunction. Some people have the wrong message. That's what cults do. If you go to a cult, they'll give you maybe 95% of the truth and 5% of error. And that error will be like a virus that will put your life in disarray and disorder. So Paul was bringing back the church to the message. What is the message? Christ and him alone crucified. Finished. I like Paul. His life was very focused. He was a very focused man. And you know, he simplified his life. He just focused on Christ and him alone crucified. It's like Jesus telling Martha, you know when he visited Martha and Mary, Martha was busy with many things, you understand? He was busy with many things. And Jesus said, you are so busy with many things, but only one thing is important. Mary has found it. What did Mary do? Mary sat at the feet of Christ and listened to Christ alone. While Martha was busy running around in the kitchen, Mary was concentrating on the main thing, the main thing. May God help us to concentrate on the main thing. So Paul continues and he says in verse 2, eh, For I resolved to know nothing while I was you, save Jesus Christ and him, alone crucified. Then he said, I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Paul's encounter with Christ made him realize that he was weak. That as a human being, he was incapable. He was weak. He realized that before Christ is nothing. He realized he had nothing more to boast about. He realized how weak he was. At some point he says, he, he says, I am the worst among sinners. He encountered the Lord and he realized how unworthy as a human being he was and he realized he could only, only totally depend on God. I don't know whether we realize our unworthiness before the Lord. You know, sometimes some of us come before God, eh? on the basis of our knowledge of human rights. It's like you come to God and you are claiming your human rights. Paul realized that he was unworthy. He was the worst of all sinners. And he realized that he sat your car. It's God's mercy. It's because of God's mercy that he can stand before God. It inculcated true humility in him. You look at the way some believers live and you wonder whether they've ever, they've ever encountered God. If you read about people who have encountered God, I am telling you, their pride was dealt with. When John, the writer of the book of Revelation, encountered, encountered Christ and him alone crucified, in Revelation chapter 1, the Bible says, if he writes and says, I fell down as one dead. He was overwhelmed. By the person of Christ. When Peter encountered Christ, eh, in the experience of fishing, I think Luke chapter 5, he tried to fish the whole night and caught nothing, like some of us. You've tried all your life, you're about to reach retirement time and caught nothing. And in one encounter like this, eh, the Lord compensated all the nights of failure. When Peter encountered that, he said, depart from me. I am a sinful man. He realized how unworthy he was. Do you realize how unworthy you are? I find Christians whose pride stinks. And I wonder whether they have ever encountered him. You know, I've been studying and I've encountered in the... <laughs> I think the capital, the, the, the capital of pride is in the academia. You encounter these professors and they literally want you to worship them. 
Yeah? For you to pass. But Paul encountered Christ and he said, I even come to you in weakness. Him standing before the people. Yeah? He did not stand before the people because he was a theologian or because he was a Pharisee or because he was a man of great standing. He said, I even stood before you yeah? in weakness. I encountered him and I realized how unworthy I was. I realized that my righteousness is like filthy rugs. I realized that back then I was operating in ignorance. He gives the believers the attitude with which they should relate to God. And the attitude with which they should relate to one another. Because you see, if you realize that without God you're nothing, you cannot treat another person like a second class citizen. You, you treat another person as, as a fellow human who is in need of the mercy of God like you are in need of the mercy of God. I find some preachers who are so proud. Some preachers have to be escorted by, I mean, they have bodyguards. Then I wonder, I, I don't see that in the scriptures. When I look at men like Paul, you know they say I came in weakness. And he says I came in weakness, in great fear. His encounter with God inculcated the fear of God in him. Do you know why we live careless lives? We don't fear God. Do you know why sometimes you come to the church and it looks like you are in a market? It's because people have lost the fear of God. Christians do the things they do because they have lost the fear of God. It is dangerous to lose the fear of God. If you are a parent and your child no longer fears you, no longer reverses you, it will be difficult for you to discipline that child. The circus in the church today is people have lost the fear of God. We play with the grace of God. We think that we can stretch God's patience. We think that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. We think the God of the New Testament is just there to massage your ego, just to look at you when you do something wrong. He says, oh, my child, you have done something wrong. Okay. If you encounter him, and you know the price he paid on the cross, you will begin to fear to sin. He says, I came in fear and in trembling. His reverence for the Christ he had seen had reached a level where he realized, I cannot mess my life. I cannot play with this with this sacrifice that was made on the cross. I think it's the book of Hebrews where, where the writer says, if we continue walking in sin, there is, no there is no more sacrifice for sin that is left. Paul, in verse 4, he says, my message, and I should be closing soon, my message and my preaching was not with wise and persuasive words. Some, these days, preachers have become motivational speakers. He says, my message was not with wise and persuasive words. He says, when I'm preaching to you, I am not trying to convince you. I am not trying to convince you. He ceased, eh? he ceased being a motivational speaker. My message was not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. What does that mean? My preaching eh, was to show you what Christ can do. My preaching was to show what God can do. God's ability and God's authority. That is what Paul's ministry focused on. What God can do. God's ability and God's authority. Through the spirit. He talks about the demonstration of the spirit's power. And I want to talk about that. Everything that God does. He does it by his spirit. The spirit of God yeah, is the manifester of who God is and what God does. 
When you read through the scriptures, you will see that everything that God did, the spirit of God was involved. In creation, in Genesis chapter 1, from verse 1 to 3, he says that when the earth was empty, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And when God spoke, let there be light, there was light. He's helping the believers to understand the role of the spirit of God in their lives. The spirit of God is the one who reveals to us who God is. It is through the spirit of God that the character of Christ is formed within us. It is even by the help of the spirit of God that we are able to pray. He's helping the believers understand that without the spirit of God, there is nothing that they can do that would qualify on God's standard. And so Paul is reminding all of us to yield, to yield to the spirit of God. That if we want to see what God can do, we need to allow his spirit to work among us, to work within us. When Jesus was, was going, he told his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send you a comforter. I will send my spirit. And he says, my spirit eh, will lead you into all truth. So that is what Paul is helping the believers yeah, to, to realize. He says, my message and preaching were not, was not with wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And then and he ends and says, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power, on the power of God. He concludes this text by saying that true faith rests in what God can do and who God is. God is the, is the source of our faith. He is the object of our faith. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. When you talk about faith, you're talking about God. So this morning as I end, may the Lord by his spirit help us to keep the main thing, the main thing. The main thing is Christ and him alone crucified. The spirit of God helps us to know Christ and him alone crucified. The Spirit of God is the one who works through us, works in us the purposes of God. And so may God help us as we focus on the main thing. Our Lord and our Father, we thank you for your word. We can never exhaust your word. Your word is so deep, it's so broad, it's so wide. But Lord, help us this morning to focus on Christ and him alone crucified. On Christ, the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so we yield to you. We pray, Lord, that just as Paul had this experience with you, in our walk, may we experience you. May we become obsessed with you, Christ, and him alone crucified. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray.